hello everyone i'll wait till it gets connected to you all hi everyone i'll wait till we all get connected hi thanks for joining how are you guys hello thank you everyone thank you for joining us here today and it's such pleasure to see you all and happy friday and happy ms awareness month it's a great great month to spread ms awareness i know ms awareness doesn't stop or nor is it restricted to one month it is 365 days 24 by 7 but this is special and for this special moment today we have a very 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 special guest joining us and many of you have requested to invite her and her name is Dr. Dr. Stoll, Dr. Sharon Stoll. She is a neurologist and she is also an MS specialist and she will tell us today about multiple sclerosis and COVID-19. Well, I get a lot of questions from so many people asking about MS and COVID-19 and the relationship between both and what if someone with MS gets COVID? Well, the answers of all your questions about MS and COVID-19. So keep your questions ready while we are connected to Dr. Sharon Stoll. I'm so excited to have her here. And uh, let me know if you have any more questions. You can just keep writing here. And uh, okay, MS Awareness Month is May in Canada. Yes, Terry. Like I said, MS Awareness Month is like three, is MS Awareness Days are 365 days. So <laughs> it's just, it's never ending. We have to keep spreading awareness. Okay, I'm accepting Dr. Sharon's request for her to join. Uh, hi, doctor. I'm accepting a request, but I think there is an issue. I'm not able to connect to you. Let me try sending invite again. There is some technical error because of which we are not able to connect to doctor. Let's try again. Okay. We know this. Hi, doctor. Hi. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. How are you? It's such a pleasure to have you here and thank you so much for accepting this request, especially this month on MS Awareness Month. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it, uh, we, we are honored to have you here and we were so, so looking forward to this session with you. In fact, we have got requests from so many people around the world asking about multiple sclerosis and COVID and who else can be better than you <laughs> to guide us on that. <laughs> So welcome. I hope I'm able to answer everyone's questions. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm sure. <laughs> Thank I'm you so try, much. I was trying to connect with my earbuds, but can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. So I guess I'll take them out. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, doctor. So just this little introduction about you, which is Dr. Sharon Stoll is uh, an MS specialist neurologist and uh, she is also a neuroimmunologist and assistant professor, a CEO, and a very, very positive and inspiring public speaker. So this is going to be a very interesting session today. It's not only talking to a doctor, but also someone who can inspire us and motivate us to be strong and positive. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. So I can see there are already so many questions coming up, you know, on the screen. But I would like to ask you the first question, which is in everyone's mind, which is, um, what treatment of MS should I take? There are <laughs> three routes that we know commonly. One is DMT, one is lifestyle, and one is something which Selma Bear is doing, which is HSCT or stem cell. And maybe there are more that we don't even know about. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's such an exciting field and it's such an exciting time to be in this field because there are so many new MS medications. So otherwise known as DMTs or disease modifying therapies. 
The first set came out in the 90s, and I can't believe that's 30 years ago. And then the introduction of oral medications have been around now for 10 plus years. And, um, and in the past five years or so, we, we have had an additional five very, very effective medications. So in terms of which medication is best for you and everyone that's listening, the medications that are best to start with a new diagnosis, first and foremost, you wanna discuss with your doctor. MS specialist would be preferred, but I know that's hard to come by in certain areas in the country and certain areas in the world. And hopefully that's something that telemedicine has helped with a little bit, just kind of getting in, getting that second opinion um, or the first opinion with a specialist. Because there's so many different medications, not every medication is right for everyone. Uh, but the one thing that I will say is we know so much about the disease now that we didn't know even just a few years ago. And one of the things that are changing is to be on a medication that's effective. And I choose that word carefully because I don't wanna say aggressive because these medications are by no means aggressive. They're just effective in that the rate of relapse reduction is significantly higher than the older generation of disease modifying therapies. So I'll leave it there. Okay, and what <laughs> do you think about people who are actually not taking disease modifying therapies, but they want to treat themselves with life sense changes? Uh, what is your opinion about that? Great question. I'm a huge fan of lifestyle modification and um, complementary and alternative therapies. I published a paper more than 10 years ago at this point uh, on complementary and alternative medication in multiple sclerosis, just to bring awareness to physicians like myself uh, of the widely used variety of different CAM therapies can complementary and alternative um, uh, medication. Uh, but because we know so much about the medication, the disease modifying medications, the safety, the efficacy, and we don't know the prognosis on a lot of patients newly diagnosed with MS. We don't know if somebody's going to end up with more mild disease 10 years from now or 20 years from now, or if somebody's going to end up in a wheelchair if they don't go on a on an effective medication. Mm -hmm. um, so I like using the two different types in combination. Um, so I'm a huge fan, again, of alternative therapies and lifestyle modification, things like reducing high salt diet or um, reducing intake of foods that have a lot of chemicals in them uh, I like telling my patients to avoid overly processed foods like McDonald's and, yes. and KFC and increasing um, intake of, of healthy foods, fresh vegetables, fresh fruits. Um, something else that we know a lot about is vitamin D intake. A lot of people are vitamin D deficient, not just people with MS, but especially in my mm -hmm. neck of the woods. Um, uh, are vitamin D deficient, and we know that can also help prevent relapses and new lesions, but it only goes so far. And the MS medications, the disease modifying therapies, takes that to the next level. So I don't think you one should do one without the other. I think this is a great time, and we know a lot, and, and the two together are, are much more effective. Uh, yes, doctor. So personally, even I have uh, experiences. For example, I am on medication since last 10 years of living with MS. And I am also taking care of my diet. So I feel that the balance of both the things really helped me to continue properly. And if anything just go haywire, like for example, if I skip my medications or if I don't eat proper food or diet, then that will, you know, have adverse effects. So I have to keep a balance of both the things. And uh, that's very correctly said. Uh, there's just one thing, you know, I, I understand that uh, when someone is newly diagnosed with MS, 
the first thing that people do is google <laughs> and when you google you yeah. just tend to get scared of anything yeah. you, you get overwhelmed so yeah. what advice would you like to give to people who are neuro diagnosed and what do's and don'ts should they consider <laughs> So for newly diagnosed patients, the best website to go to is the National MS Society. That has the most up-to-date information. Um, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of things on Google that can be very scary. I would say avoid chat rooms, avoid groups. Don't go on Instagram groups or Facebook groups or anything like that because everyone's experience is different. And a lot of people that write things about themselves it's it's their own personal experience it's not going to be your experience every one of the one of the most confusing and complex things about this disease is that it's different for everybody there's a lot of symptoms and a lot of things that people experience that are similar across the board but then there are people that can have much more severe uh, disabling relapses and also keep in mind that a lot of people that were diagnosed more than 10 years ago, they don't have access or they didn't then have access to the treatments that we have access, accessible to us now. And if you're, if you're, really, if you're newly diagnosed now, it's, it's a good time. Not that there's ever a good time to be diagnosed with MS, but it's a good time in that we know so much more about the disease that we didn't know back then and there's so many more effective medications that can really stop progression and stop new relapses. And that's something that we couldn't say 10 years ago. So keep in mind any, any of these chats, any of, of um, people that you're listening to, likely they were diagnosed 10 plus years ago and their experience and their disease progression or relapses are going to be extremely different than yours. And the most important thing is not to get scared and to schedule an appointment with a neurologist. Yes, absolutely. So what happens that, you know, uh, 10 years back, whatever medicines we were having, now we have ad advanced a lot medically. So we have mm -hmm. treatments like and all, which are really giving us very successful uh, results when it's done on, a, on the patients, but those medicines are also not available in every country. Right. So like we say that every individual is different, every patient is different. You have to consult your neurologist and see what is available in your country and get the treatment accordingly. I yeah. always say that if some, someone is on interferon, it doesn't mean that it will suit everyone. If someone is an ocrobus, it will suit everyone. Everybody is different. Same goes with the diet. Same goes with the exercises. Same goes with the lifestyle changes, everything. You have to exactly. know your own body in and out. And you have to try everything, what's suiting you or not suiting you. Speaking of Okrabus, I can see there's a question by Pavlos. And she, he's written that, what is your opinion about Okrabus and the long-term administration? That's a great question. I'm a huge fan of Okrabus, otherwise known as Okralizumab. Um, the type of medication that it is, the mechanism of action or how it works on one's body is called an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. And I know that's, that's a mouthful, um, but there are two other medications that work, that have that same mechanism of action. So I, that's just something that I want to throw out there, that it's not the only one with this mechanism of action. Um, and all three of them are extremely effective for the treatment of multiple sclerosis. In terms of long-term safety um, or, or long-term efficacy, um, the medication that, so ocrelizumab is actually based off of an older medication called rituxan or rituximab that's been available since 1997. So it's been out for a long time, but we haven't used it in multiple sclerosis patients for that long. Um, mm -hmm. And so ocrelizumab, came out or hit the market in the United States. I know it came out in Europe much later, but in the US it came out in 2017. So it's been five years now since the medication has been out. And in terms of clinical trials, it's been available or, or we have treatment data um, for a lot longer than that. And it, it continues to have good efficacy year after year. 
and, mm -hmm. and relatively good safety year after year. And I say relatively good safety because again, it hasn't been out for 20 years. Um, but the parent medication, Rituxan or Rituximab, has been out longer. And right now, we don't see any high-risk safety signs other than uh, with COVID and people that have risk factors for COVID separate yes. from the MS or disease-modifying therapy. So I, I, um, I choose my words carefully because... <laughs> For most people, um, COVID, COVID um, um, vaccines, it, it's, there is a risk, an increased risk, but there's a significantly increased risk if somebody has other risk factors for multiple sclerosis, like being in a wheelchair over the age of 65, uh, past medical history of uh, cardiovascular disease like heart attacks or heart disease or lung disease or diabetes. So we have to separate those two out because unfortunately, just because we have multiple sclerosis or one has multiple sclerosis doesn't rule out the possibility of other diseases, unfortunately. I wish, I wish we could just have one disease and that's it, but it doesn't work that way. Exactly. It doesn't work that way. So speaking about COVID and uh, Ogrivers, so when COVID came first and people who were on Ogrivers were particularly very scared because it's immune suppressant. So then the doctor said, okay, so that group should take the um, COVID vaccine first and isolate themselves, stay away. And then the journalist crowd started taking the vaccines. So what's your opinion about the people who are on immunosuppressants and have, uh, of course, MS? And uh, is it okay to take uh, vaccines? And what if they do get COVID? Then what? All great questions. <laughs> um, so the in response to your first question, vaccines and Ocrevus or Ocrelizumab or other um uh, immunosuppressants and things that fit into that category. We didn't think they fit into that category, but now we know that it reduces the response to the COVID vaccine. Um, S1Ps, so that's Jelenia, Mazant, Zipanamod, things like that. Um, and then other uh, CD20s, so that's Kisemta and um, Limtrada, um, Lymtrad is a, a different mechanism of action, but it's in that category. Um, surprisingly, for those on Tysabri, Tysabri is not in that category, um, yes. which, is, which was surprising to all of us, but, but a good surprise. And um, so for all of those other medications, um, it does reduce your response to the vaccine. And uh, the best time to get vaccinated if on one of those medications is either before you start taking one of those medications for newly diagnosed people, uh, either two to four weeks before or about four weeks before your next infusion. Um, or when, what we were saying in the beginning of this pandemic was really just when your lottery number gets, gets picked and you're able to get a vaccine, just get the vaccine. Yeah. Um, but right now, that's not, that's not true anymore. In terms of boosters, we're recommending boosters, um, which are extremely effective. And then in terms of um, the different variants, so now the most recent variant that we've experienced is the Omicron variant. Yes. And um, personally, I've had a lot of patients with Omicron that have been on a medication like Ofrilizumab, and they've actually surprisingly done very well. <laughs> just in terms of disease symptoms of, of COVID. And, wow. um, but that's the patients that were vaccinated and boosted so that got what, Omicron. So what about the long-term effects? So for example, it happened. So it happened in my case for that matter. I had got Delta variant and I am, I am on the uh, um, uh, Avenix. So what happens that happened with me was when I had Delta variant in April, I was fine. The only thing I had was a little bit of brain fog mm -hmm. and fatigue, mm -hmm. tremendous fatigue. That's it. Otherwise, I was 
fine. It was manageable. I did not have to take steroids. Nothing. I was absolutely fine. I got recovered within a few days. But the after effects of COVID remained in my body even after seven to eight months. I mean, it yeah. just did not go. For example, I had lots of hormonal issues that I started cropping in my body. Then uh, 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 fatigue had remained and my taste, smell had altered completely. And my muscle spasm became such a common thing for me, which was never there, there ever. I could relate a lot of symptoms of MS and COVID that was like connecting. And, um, and finally, in the month of January, January 1st, the new year eve, I got a relapse. And then after the relapse, when I was actually given steroids, then my, some of my symptoms actually became better. Imagine, so eight months I have been living with this, all these symptoms after COVID, even though I was fine when I had COVID. And after the relapse, after it was like uh, my body was screaming from inside and then it just bursted out, got a relapse, <laughs> and then I became okay. <laughs> yeah. So that, that was difficult. So long-term effects. So what have you observed about long-term symptoms of COVID in MS patients? That's that's a great question. So as a neurologist, as a neuroimmunologist, um, it's something that I've been, I've been thinking about reading all, every paper I can get my hands on. And post COVID, especially with the um, alpha variant, the beta variant, the delta variant, um, the rate of post COVID syndrome or long haul phenomenon um, is significant, even for those that that have relatively mild symptoms from the COVID like, like you did. Um, it, it, it's as much as 30% of people that have had long, long haul syndrome with COVID. And with long haul syndrome, we see things like headache is, is number one, fatigue, um, body pain, muscle aches. People still have shortness of breath for those that, that um, have not even pulmonary disease, but had a cough with their COVID. And I've actually seen people that didn't really have lung or pulmonary issues with COVID. And then afterwards they develop this chronic cough. Um, so definitely COVID does a lot to the immune system. And I think that's one of the reasons when you got your steroids, it kind of calms down the immune system systemically. So in the body, it calms it down. And that's why a lot of your, your post COVID symptoms resolved at that point. Um, uh, that would be something that would be interesting to look at and interesting to treat post COVID or long haul syndrome with steroids to see what happens. Um, just thinking of, of research ideas, if anybody listening, is, you know, a, a researcher or scientist, and, and they want to propose that question or, or find out an answer for us. Now let, let me know. Um, but um, in terms of MS patients on, on all of the different disease modifying therapies, MS patients are not, um, they're not saved from post COVID phenomenon just because a lot of MS patients have those symptoms with relapses or with their disease at baseline. So a lot of my patients have fatigue, headaches, um, yes. muscle pain. And one of the things that I have seen, though, with, um, thank God, not a lot of my patients experienced COVID with the first uh, wave or Delta, um, but a lot with Omicron. And that's one of the things that I've noticed. The fatigue um, has, has lasted a lot longer than just the acute effect infection. So we think of acute infection period being five to 12 days. And a lot of my patients had severe fatigue going out a month to six weeks. Wow. So it does seem to get better eventually, but it takes a lot longer. Yes. And, um, and I think that is a direct result of the multiple sclerosis, regardless of what medication somebody is on. Uh, having said that though, a lot of people with the initial infections experience fatigue, chronic fatigue, debilitating fatigue, like MS patients do, months out, and headaches months out. So that's something that unfortunately we still don't know a lot about, 
Um, but as time goes on, I'm sure we'll learn a lot more. Yes, thank you, doctors. <laughs> That's quite insightful. <laughs> I can see a lot of questions coming up, so I'll just take a few questions one by one as well. Um, sure. So I can see a question by Nadul Khamis, and she's written, I want to ask about something that does MS have anything to do with electrifying the face? It comes as a shock to the face and the feet. Sorry, say that once more. I just... Yes. Say that does, once more. I... Does MS have anything to do with electrifying the face that comes as a shock to the face and the feet? <laughs> yes. So that, there's a phenomenon that's called Lermite's phenomenon or Lermite's syndrome. And that's when there's a lesion or a white spot in the spinal cord and people experience this shock sensation like you're sitting in an electrical chair that's how it was originally described i think over a hundred years ago by Lermit. Mm -hmm. and it's when the spinal cord is stretched so if you think of it as as a rope if there's stretching of that of that rope um then there's there's misfiring where that lesion is and if you think of it as like a electrical cord, I'm trying to find an electrical cord around me, um, where the wire or where the insulation, that rubber around that electrical cord is cut, and then you pull that apart, you might get shocked, right? Um, so it's the same thing that happens in our, in our body, in our spinal cord, we're like one big circuit. And one of the things that happens or that it'll bring on that shock phenomenon is stretching the cord by let's say putting your head down to your chest so some people would say oh i get this shock sensation every time i sneeze and you think about mm -hmm. how you move when you sneeze you go at so mm -hmm. you you your head goes down and then it's a zap ah or you know you look down to tie your shoes then you get a shock and uh, that's one of the very common features seen with multiple sclerosis that was one of my first symptoms when I was diagnosed. Oh God, it was such a weird sensation just getting the electrifying current from your head to the toe. You, yeah. And be like, that, what just happened to me? Yeah. That, oh my God. <laughs> I, I get goosebumps every time I even think about that. That was terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is. <laughs> It's something okay. a lot of people don't understand and, you know, and you're sitting there and you, you might be around a group of people and, and you'll, you know, look down and then you go, ah, and then everybody looks at you like, well, what just happened? And you're thinking, I, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I just stuck my finger in a socket. I remember we just, you know, with a group of friends and we were just talking about something. I just had a nice laugh. And the moment I started laughing, oh God, a current, I'm like, okay, <laughs> I can't even laugh now. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank God, it's <laughs> But yeah, that's something that um, if anybody listening, if that's a symptom that they're still experiencing or that they recently developed, it does get better over time. It does go away. However, it can come back with increased stress or increased heat um, at any time point in the future. But the good news is, if, if it goes away and it comes back periodically uh, in the distant future, it doesn't mean you're having another relapse. It doesn't mean you're having uh, another lesion in your spine. It just means that there's increased in heat, similar to an electrical circuit, you know, increased heat. It'll, it'll bring that symptom back temporarily. It doesn't mean it's going to cause long-term damage. And that's just if you have it here and there in the future. Um, if you have that plus brand new symptoms, then you definitely want to contact your neurologist because you may be having another relapse. Right. So when you're talking about heat, you know, uh, I'm also getting a lot of questions from people who are talking about hot feet. So what is this hot feet and how, you know, can this be taken care of, you know, at home? You know, if a person doesn't want to have a lot of medications every time they're getting it, how to manage it? That's a great question. So if I understand correctly, hot feet, it's like um, uh, frostbite. So burning, but freezing and like an ice pick on your feet at the same time. Is that, is that kind of what that, that hot feet is? I just is know that? that it's a burning 
sensation inside as Burning. if the feet is on yeah. fire. So that's that's something called neuropathy. And that's when the, um, and people get it in their feet and they can also get it in their hands. And it's usually much, much worse at nighttime when they mm -hmm. first get into bed and they try and get comfortable, then it's all of a sudden, oh my gosh, my feet are burning and it's painful and I can't go to sleep. And a lot of people think that they have it at night when they're, when they're first relaxing because, well, maybe I have it during the day, but I'm not paying attention to it because I'm too busy doing other things. And now there's nothing else to do when I'm trying to go to sleep and now it's coming out. It's actually just much worse at night. A lot of people won't have that phenomenon during the day or it won't be as bad during the day. And then at night, it's much worse. And that's something that's common across the board. The best thing to do, unfortunately, is to go on a medication, a nerve medication called Neurontin, Gabapentin, Lyrica, Pregabalin. So two meds, but four names. <laughs> um, so Gabapentin and... Um, Neurontin, that's, that's one drug, and Lyrica or Pregabalin is another drug. And they both work in a very similar way, and it dampens down this nerve signal. It's basically, it's again, it's misfiring of neurons, if you think of it as a big electrical circuit, and it's just your, your, the ends of, of these nerves, so distally in the bottom of your feet, which is the farthest part from your spinal cord or your brain, um, they're just frayed and it's just firing and, and misfiring and it's just sending the wrong signal to the brain. So the best thing to do is to dampen down that signal and the only real way to do that, unfortunately, is with medication. I wish there was, I wish I could tell you to have like an ice bucket by your bed and to stick your feet in that ice bucket, but it doesn't help. Um, for people, a lot of people also will get spasms or Charlie horse in their calf muscles when they lie down at night for the first time. Um, and, uh, and it can be extremely painful and excruciating. And that's something that can also be helped with with medication. But there's also a non-medication alternative to that. And that is stretching of your, of your calves. And um, what I recommend is when you lie down for the first time, for those that have like an exercise band at home to keep it next to their bed, you put the exercise band around your feet and you pull up and you keep your feet, your feet straight. Or if you don't have a band like that, if you, um, if you sit up in bed, you have your, your legs straight and then you, you kind of pull your, your toes to your nose. And if anybody listening wants to try that now, you basically, you could even do it in a sitting position. I'm doing it right now. Uh, so feet straight, knees straight, and then toes to the nose, and then you'll feel that stretch in the back of your leg and in the calf muscle. And, um, and stretching those muscles will help prevent it from going into spasm. Actually, this is very important because, you know, there are so many people I believe must be professionals and going to offices as well. So especially for those people who are, you know, just sitting in the chair for like nine hours and continuously walking, you have to keep stretching so this is yeah. a very nice way to even sit at your position and stretch even, in, yes. even if you're in office yes but the more the more you walk around during the day the more you move around during the day the more that muscle is going to want to tighten up when you relax for the first time at night so it's really important to do that before getting into bed or or right when you get into bed but unfortunately that hot feet phenomenon medication <laughs> unfortunately okay thank you <laughs> thank you uh, so i can see the question by Ritor noah fultura and she's written that the horrible ms hug like i cannot take a deep breath please guide me yes that that is something unfortunately a lot of people have and that is similar to the spasms that people get in their calf muscles and it's, it's the same thing. It's, it's a spasm. It's a muscle spasm. So basically the muscle just tightens up um, and it feels like a big knot in your, in your ribs. Um, some people can even feel that knot and, and rub on it. Um, it lasts usually two to 10 minutes, but it can feel like an hour. Um, 
and the pain is severe and it's agonizing. And if that's something that happens often, daily even, um, then I would recommend going on a medication like baclofen um, to kind of calm that down. And it's baclofen is a muscle relaxant and it's one of those medications. There's other medications like scalaxin that doesn't have that same daytime fatigue. Um, but unfortunately, it, it can be painful, it can be debilitating and, and fearful. I mean, if you don't know when you're going to get it, it can be extremely, extremely scary. And if you're somebody that actually will have that MS hug um, often, or if it lasts a long time, um, then keep baclofen or, or muscle relaxant with you and take it when it happens. But keep in mind, it takes about 20 minutes to kick in. And usually the spasm's done within 20 minutes. Okay. So it doesn't help that much, unfortunately, if you're taking it as, as needed. Okay, thank you, doctor. Uh, sure. I can see a, someone writing that, you know, when I stretch my legs, it shakes uncontrollably. So what can I do for that? Um, that's a good question. Um, it's something that I don't hear quite often. And I think I would have to see the kind of shaking that happens um, to better give advice. Absolutely. So I'll suggest please consult your neurologist. Maybe yes. they recommend you to a physiotherapist or someone who can help you out then. Yes. Um, Physical therapists are amazing. Amazing, amazing. And we have MS specialized physiotherapists also nowadays. Yes. Understand what your need is. Mm -hmm. um, I can see a um, comment by K. Kardashian, and she's written at nighttime, my eyes get super watery. People commonly ask if I'm crying. My vision sometimes doubles or gets blurry. What is it? <laughs> um, watery eyes it could be a whole slew of things. And I would definitely stop by your ophthalmologist um, to figure that one out because that can be that it's possible it's not related to multiple sclerosis, uh, watery eyes, or even dry eyes. Um, so that's something I definitely I would recommend uh, talking to an ophthalmologist about. All right. Thank you, doctor. Uh, I can see a lot of people here asking about uh, something which I really want to touch upon is depression. Depression is something which, you know, can be caused because of many things. Firstly, knowing that you have MS, you have a neurological condition and you have to be on DMTs or whatever forever. That is one thing. Then the medicines you are, you are taking, for example, DMTs, sometimes they also have the side effect that it might cause you depression and suicidal thoughts. That is one thing. Staying with, in pain forever is bad. It can cause depression. And the last thing which I uh, recently uh, no, God, for the first time, I'm a very positive person. I'm the one who's advocating and always, you know, telling people, motivating people to be positive. And this time after my relapse and taking steroids, for the first time I felt depressed. I don't know why I cried. When I asked my doctor, he said it's because of MS and because of long um, uh, health issues, COVID and all that you have been having. So it's all coming back as a burden. And but... It's just scary to be depressed yes. and not yeah. knowing what you're saying. <laughs> yes. So you touched on on basically every every possibility, and and that's all true. Um, I would say that a hundred percent. There's a reactive depression. So first learning of the diagnosis or or having a relapse. Um, you know it, it, that can all be a reactive depression. So similar to if a loved one dies. You could be a very happy person, but a loved one dies, you're going to be depressed for a period of time. If, if that period of time has passed and it's no longer a reactive depression and you're kind of sitting there and you don't know why you're depressed, that there's nothing that's, that's changed, there's, everything's fine, let's say your symptoms resolved, but you still are depressed, um, it, there could be, it could be a side effect of the medication. So interferons, it, it's a very common side effect of just interferons itself. Uh, so you may want to talk to your neurologist about switching that medication because we know it is a side effect. 
In terms of MS and depression, yes, there is an increased risk of depression with MS, just like MS with MS, there is an increased risk of, of headaches. And um, to that effect, there's a lot of medications that kind of do two things. So two birds, one stone. Um, there's a depression medication that we also use for the treatment of neuropathy, that burning feet sensation. And so, uh, you know, I, I put a lot of patients on, on that one medication if they have both. There's an antidepressant medication that can also treat headaches. So again, two birds, one stone. If there's one med that takes care of two problems, you know, I'm all for it. Um, so these are things that you definitely want to talk to your neurologist about because there's, there's medications to, to treat it. And it's something that should be treated. It shouldn't be stigmatized. It shouldn't just be, oh, you have MS, you have depression, or oh, you have this chronic disease. Of course, you're depressed. And, you know, I don't need to tell my doctor and I, I just live my life and, and, you know, I'm just sad all the time because I have this disease. No, take control just like you would go on something for the treatment of multiple sclerosis so it doesn't get worse, so it's not debilitating, you want to be on something for depression so that it doesn't get worse and it doesn't become debilitating. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. You would treat your burning feet, your ne neuropathic pain. Let's treat the depression also. Absolutely. Um, to this, even I would like to add uh, to this is that um, you know, when you're depressed, firstly, uh, share your feelings. Do not keep it to yourself. You know, sharing makes you feel lighter. Um, yes, there will be time where you want to scream and shout. You'll be sad. <laughs> you don't know why. But do not keep things to yourself. Share that you are having this kind of problems with your loved ones or people you live with or people Absolutely. who are best friends. Um, secondly, uh, I always believe that you are your best friend and only you can help yourself. Only you. So find thing that might make you happy, make you smile, you know, maybe try something new, which you have never done before. I always say that, you know, always uh, uh, do something that engrossed you and you get busy with something that you forget the other thing. But when it comes to depression, you don't forget things because it is in your mind. It is uh, there inside you. You cannot forget it. So along with it, you know, what can really make you happy? really make you smile maybe a simple thing like going on instagram and making a reel or going on tiktok and doing some dance or just putting some music and doing aerobics and dancing around maybe that will help you even for 15 minutes a day you do that will help you overcome your depression a little bit so do whatever that makes you smile and happy maybe meeting your friends can be one of those things going and seeing your parents can help you with that so do whatever makes you happy and don't be scared to say that, yes, you're feeling depressed. If you are, you can, of course, treat yourself with medications as well, along with the other things that you can only understand what makes you happy. So <laughs> that's what I wanted to just share with my personal experience. <laughs> it's great advice. <laughs> um, okay, I have a question by Ellie and she is just 16 years old. And uh, she's saying um, that I'm having rebif and will I have to take this medication for the rest of my life? That's a great question. That's something I get all the time. No, but you may need to be on something for a bit longer because you're so young. Um, multiple sclerosis being an autoimmune disease, your immune system, the more active it is, the more it is likely to attack you. And if you think about it, multiple sclerosis is, is the diagnosis is made when our immune systems are the, are the healthiest um, or the most active. And, and that's why little kids um, and, and older adults, we don't really make that diagnosis of MS in, in that kind of age range because Little kids are more likely to get sick. They're more likely to end up in the hospital for pneumonia, infection, croup. These, these things that um, when our immune systems are, are healthy, uh, we see less of. And the same thing with the elder. Um, pneumonia, um, shingles, uh, these kinds of infections are not things that we, we think about or we worry about in our 20s or 30s um, or at 16. And... We think of, of multiple sclerosis medications in the same way. 
So as we get older, our immune systems are generally not as active. They're not as robust. So one of the things that we've been researching in the field of multiple sclerosis is at what point can we stop medication? Our medications, our MS medications, something that we need to be on for the rest of our lives. And that's something that, um, you know, we're, we're collecting more and more data on, but a lot of, a lot of studies show that by 60, 65, we can back off on MS medications, but of course it depends on everyone's disease history. So for people that have been stable for years and years, no new lesions, no new changes, um, that's a conversation to have with your doctor at that time. But in terms of rebif, rebif itself, hopefully not, um, but transitioning to a different medication that you may have to be on for longer, yes. Um, but that's a great conversation to have with your physician, with your neurologist, um, because the meds only work if you take it. So if you're reaching a point where you don't want to take that med anymore, there are other ones available. And that's a great, great conversation to have with your doctor. That was very positive, doctor. Thank you so much. Uh, I can see a lot of questions here and we have all already, you know, been talking since last 45 minutes. Um, do you have time to take just uh, one more, maybe last question? Before sure, we... one, one more question. <laughs> all right. So I can see a question. Um, okay. Oh, well, there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I can see this question. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I could just see this question. <laughs> okay, does cryotherapy help people with MS or should I stay away from it? <laughs> that's a great question. Um, it's a question that's been coming up more and more in my, in my clinic. Um, we don't have good data that cryotherapy works for multiple sclerosis. I know it works for a lot of other different diseases, um, but for MS, we still don't have good data that it is effective. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. Thank you so much for all your advices and such a wonderful session. I am we are just blasted with so many questions here. <laughs> we are just running I mean, we cannot take all of this. This can just go endless. Maybe we can, you know, connect once again and do this kind of session again when we have time <laughs> to answer the remaining questions. Uh, but thank you very much, doctor, for, you know, helping us and being so positive. Your every answer was, you know, not just by a medical professional, but from someone who is, you know, instilling positivity and encouraging us to stay <laughs> happy. Even with MS, just be positive. So thank you so much for all, all your great advices and your help with us today. Sure. Thank you so much to everyone that joined us today and for all the great questions. <laughs> thank you so much, doctor. And uh, probably we can do this again next time in your time. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm happy to. Thank you, doctor, so much once again. And have a good day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Thank you. And everyone join and look uh, watching us today here, you know, can you please um, go and to doctor's um, Instagram profile, doctor underscore stall and follow her there. And you can also check her website and what her, all great work that she is doing. And uh, of course, and we'll also be having a podcast coming out very soon with Dr. Stoll. So stay tuned for that. Thank you, doctor. Bye. Bye. Thank you everyone for joining today and for your wonderful questions. I'm really sorry for you know, not being able to take many of your questions, but I promise that I'll be, I'll try to get the answer. So uh, stay tuned for the podcast with Dr. Stoll and uh, you take care and have a great weekend and keep spreading MS awareness. It's MS awareness month. So take care and thank you everyone. Bye-bye.